Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, like Jen said, my name is Eric Frederick. I'm the Executive Director for Connect Michigan. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about digital literacy today um, and what it means to workforce and economic development in Michigan and what are some tools or what might be a model for expanding digital literacy at a local level. I'll talk a little bit about where we are as far as digital, digital literacy goes, uh, what the definition of that is, um, if some of you may or may not be familiar with the term. Um, and then, of course, what, what that means for the state of Michigan. So just a little bit about Connect Michigan. We are a nonprofit organization partnered with the Michigan Public Service Commission, and our task is to facilitate the expansion of broadband access, adoption, and use throughout the state of Michigan. So we are not a broadband provider. We are not a government entity. We are in this, in this kind of third space uh, between the two. So we are backed by Connected Nation, which is a national technology-oriented nonprofit organization that's been working on broadband issues for a decade or so. Uh, we have a couple in-state staff, uh, myself, which I used to be the program manager, um, and then we also have two community technology advisors. And again, our, our three major areas of work that we do are broadband mapping, broadband research, and broadband community planning and outreach, which I know a couple of you on the, on the webinar today are, are familiar with or very familiar with. Um, so I just want to give you that brief overview of, of who we are and what we do, um, just because we are kind of a, a unique and unusual organization. So the idea to look at digital literacy in Michigan came really by observing a few different things that I've grouped together into three categories. The first was um, facilitated by technology, information and knowledge have become the major factors controlling wealth creation in the, in the knowledge economy. Um, knowledge economy is a term that's been around for quite a while. Um, it's heavily influenced by technology, and, and we have seen um, a change from traditional occupations to more knowledge-based or service occupations. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's one of the foundations for this research. Um, and we've also found through our research that I'll get into in a little bit that Michiganders who use the Internet at work have incomes that are three times higher than those who do not. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit. That's kind of a startling fact um, that we want to look at and examine why that is. Uh, one of our other observations was that more than 95% of jobs require the, the use of computer hardware and more than 50% require the use of email and or internet browser software and 46% require the use of some sort of office productivity software, Microsoft Office or their counterparts on the Macintosh system. Um, so Macintosh, Apple. Um, so take these two things together and we're seeing that um, a digitally literate workforce that knows how to operate a a hardware and software is going to be important for, uh, for the economy in a thriving Michigan. So thirdly, what we looked at was um, we, we found through our surveys that uh, just over 2 million Michigan adult adults do not subscribe to broadband at home. It's about, about 29%. So this is a, a fairly high number. It's, it's on average maybe a little bit higher than the national average of subscribership to broadband. Um, but I think most startling is that 17% of those who don't subscribe to broadband at home state some sort of digital literacy as their primary barrier to adoption. And I'll get into that a little bit too. So combine these three categories of observations together. That's what pushed us to look a little bit more about digital literacy in the state of Michigan. So again, our purpose today, uh, I want to talk about quickly about a definition of digital literacy that we use to, uh, for this research. I want to look at the relationship between digital literacy and workforce and economic development. Uh, I want to look at the current state of digital literacy in Michigan uh, that I've, I've, I've briefly touched on. I want to look at various digital literacy training models in Michigan and abroad because there, is, there has been a number of programs over the last four or five years uh, looking at expanding digital literacy across the country that we can use here in Michigan at a local level to hopefully um, have a more uh, digitally literate workforce. And then at the, at the very end, I want to propose a model for expanding digital literacy training opportunities in the state. So let's start with that definition of digital literacy. Um, back in the 1970s, um, it was really known as information literacy and has since evolved from there. Uh, you can see a number of terms at the top of the screen that describe or come close to describing what we're going to be using as a definition of digital literacy. Uh, any, anything from e-skills to technical skills, which is a little broad, e-business skills, uh, information skills, media literacy. Um, many different government entities define digital literacy different, 
all the way down to state governments, national governments. Um, everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, the definitions really, though, are all focused on the ability to find and use information. And in the 21st century, that really means using a computer and using the Internet. Uh, digital literacy is related to the digital divide um, in that varying skills or abilities can exclude groups from the use of broadband, thus their participation in the knowledge economy. So we explore that a little bit in the co-learning plan, but we're not going to look at that uh, specifically today. Um, the definitions that we're going to use for our purposes today come from the United States National Broadband Plan. Um, and that definition of digital literacy is a variety of skills associated with using ICT, or information communications technologies, to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information. Um, this, again, focuses on those skills. So that's really where we want to make that, that bridge is what are those skills that somebody needs to have to participate in the knowledge economy to be able to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information? Um, the FCC goes on to recognize that digital literacy is the sum of the technical and cognitive skills people employ to use computers to retrieve information, interpret what they find, and judge the quality of that information. Uh, we're going to be mostly focused on the technical skills, not the cognitive skills. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, but definitely more on the technical skills um, for how people can use hardware and software to retrieve and interpret information. So let's look at that relationship now that we have a, a definition and we know that we're looking at uh, the technical skills somebody needs to participate in the knowledge economy and operate uh, computer hardware and software. Let's look at how that relates to economic development. So as the economy shifts from resource-driven to information-driven, so too then shifts the tools and technology required to participate in that technology economy, like we've mentioned so far. Um, and while um, the development of information communications technologies have created new occupations and industries, the focus here is definitely on how ICTs have transformed and enhanced occupations across sectors. So we're not just looking at ICT occupations themselves, we're looking more broadly at how uh, basic digital liter literacy skills impact occupations across sectors, and we wanted to find that relationship. Um, and that was that was a that was a struggle at first. So this pyramid, this upside down pyramid you see on the on the screen, really looks starts at a very broad definition of how we're we're looking at um, the impact of digital literacy skills on on the economy. So we start with um, the expansion of the knowledge economy. Then we look more narrowly a little bit at ICT occupations, and then we look very micro at the actual tools and technology um, needed across various occupational sectors. And I'll go through each one of those. So let's start with the knowledge economy expansion. Again, the, knowledge econ the term the knowledge economy has been around for a while now. Um, and um, these two categories you see on the screen really were defined by Richard Florida back in 2002 as those that he, that he is claiming are knowledge-based and those that are traditional occupations. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the nuances of these, but just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, um, um, computers and mathematics, architecture, engineering, sciences, education. These are all knowledge-based economies or knowledge-based occupation sectors that he's defining. And then traditional occupations would be construction, installation, repair, transportation, and material moving, things of that nature. Um, the problem with this definition is that the impact of digital literacy and information communications technology um, affects both of these categories. So we do want to look at how the knowledge economy is expanded because they tend to use technology more than traditional occupational sectors, but there is a definitely a case that the ICTs really impact um, all of these sectors together. So just to give you a little bit of, of occupational history on the knowledge economy, um, these bars at the top, if you can see my mouse, the blue bar represents U.S. knowledge occupations over time, and the green bar is Michigan knowledge occupations over time. And you can see from 1999 through, projected through 2020, knowledge economy occupations are, are projected to, to grow, to steadily increase for both Michigan and the U.S. Uh, the bottom bars here, the, the red bar is occupation, traditional occupations in the United States, and um, traditional occupations in Michigan is the purple bar. Um, and these are as a, as a share of total employment. Um, so Michigan, with its manufacturing and auto industry history, uh, maintains a higher percentage of traditional occupations, uh, higher than the rest of the United States. But the trend of traditional occupations declining is definitely there. So again, we're, we're, we're assuming that ICTs really impact the knowledge economy more. And we can see that um, 
in this chart, but what, we're, what we really want to look at is what about digital, basic digital literacy skills? What, what data do we have in place to really look at how those basic digital literacy skills impact the economy? So in, so in short, we know that the knowledge economy and the use of ICTs in the knowledge economy sector is growing. So take it one step further in looking at actual occupations related to ICT. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, which is an international organization, defines ICT employment in three different categories. First, we have IT, ICT specialists, and these guys are your network administrators. These are the guys that make your computers at the office work um, and that you probably don't want to get on their bad side. Um, so these are, these are people who use, develop, and operate and maintain ICT systems, um, and the OECD defines 18 of them. Uh, they also define advanced and basic users of ICT. So advanced users would be more in the engineering fields and, and the science fields, where, while basic users would be um, word processors, administrative assistants, um, and any number of other occupations that are, are basic users. So I started looking at this, this information. I got really excited because this basic user definition is really what, uh, it, it starts to point to what we're looking at for, def, you know, the, for how the skills related to digital literacy impact the economy. But then in researching further, we found that the OECD actually only identifies 83 occupations across these three categories, 18 of them as specialists and 65 between the advanced and basic occupation uh, definitions. And that represents only 11% of all of the occupations defined by the, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and just intuitively, we know that um, more occupations than that use, uh, use computer technology um, and, and use the Internet and use email. So this information is great in, in showing how um, ICT occupations have their, uh, have their place in the U.S. and Michigan economies and how they're projected to grow by 2020, uh, more so at a national level than in Michigan, but still projected to grow. Um, but it really doesn't get us quite to the point of um, – looking at basic digital literacy skills and the impact on the economy. So finally, uh, we came to the Occupational Information Network. And this organization maintains occupational taxonomy, um, which uh, defines any number of, um, of elements for any occupation from um, entry level uh, education that's needed to typical job descriptions to tax, tasks on the job. Um, it, weight that's required to be lifted on the job, anything that you can think of that defines an occupation, um, the ONET takes care of. Well, one of the things that they did recently was develop a database that defines the necessary tools and technology uh, to be successful on the job. And they did this for 670 occupations, which isn't quite the full complement of Bureau of Labor Statistics occupations, but still much closer than the 11% we saw from OECD. So we took those tools and technology definitions and pulled out four categories that we felt were uh, related to basic digital literacy skills. So number one, we looked at computer hardware. So that was any occupation that required the use of a laptop, a desktop, or a personal computer. No, no servers, no systems, basic uh, desktop computing. Uh, the second category, category was the use of electronic mail software, so email. Uh, third was the use of an internet browser. And then fourth was uh, the use of Office Suite software, again, Microsoft Office or its counterparts on an Apple system. Um, and we found that by looking at these different categories that more than 95% of the occupations that had defined tools and technology required the use of some sort of computer hardware, again, the laptop, desktop, or personal computer. Um, we found that more than 50% required the use of electronic mail software, and 51% required the use of Internet browser to be successful in those occupations, and just over 46% required the use of Office Suite software. Um, so this really helped us define that the, the need for digital literacy skills is broad and it affects all occupations. We didn't divide these into occupational sectors because, again, we were looking at how digital literacy affects jobs across the economy. Um, but we found that almost all jobs require some sort of use of computer hardware and more than half um, some sort of common electronic mail or internet browser software. Now, there, you might be asking yourself about the gap between this 52% or let's say 51% for an internet browser 
and 95% for computer hardware. Um, there were a lot of jobs that required computer hardware, but then only one or two packages of specialty software for that industry, and that's where that gap is. But we looked at email and internet browser as basic, um, basic software uses um, that, that apply to, to basic digital literacy skills. So in summary, we know that knowledge sector jobs, which heavily rely on ICTs, are projected to grow, um, and traditional occupations are declining. Um, ICTs have created new positions and new occupations and enhanced other occupations. Um, and from our research with ONET, we found that most occupations require the use of computer hardware and more than half require the use of an internet browser or email, uh, which I, I, I believe is significant. So digital literacy skills are required to work in both knowledge and traditional occupations because that last analysis was across um, occupational sets, um, ICT related or otherwise. So let's look at the state of digital literacy then in Michigan and, and see where we're at. Uh, we did a survey back in 2012 of um, 1,200 households in the state of Michigan and asked about their broadband and technology habits, whether they subscribe to broadband at home, what they use it for, um, and most importantly, why don't you have broadband at home if you don't? So 29% of Michigan residents do not subscribe to broadband at home, so that 2.1 million adults. Um, and approximately 361,000 of those state that state their primary barrier to home broadband adoption is related to digital literacy. And when we define digital literacy as a barrier, we look at these at, at four things here. We look at um, if their primary barrier was concerned with fraud or identity identity theft, which we know is a big issue and going online. Um, if they said broadband is too complicated, if they don't feel comfortable using a computer, or if they said that they do not know enough about broadband or I don't know what it is. Those we consider digital literacy barriers to uh, home broadband adoption. Now one thing that we didn't ask for or test for in our research was um, the possibility that someone may have felt embarrassed admitting that they had a digital literacy issue when stating their barrier to adoption. Um, but we do believe that there may be some, that these rates may be higher um, because of that, that phenomena. So it's something that we're looking at for future surveys to really help nail down the instance of digital literacy in the state. But I just wanted you to be aware that we didn't test for it this time, but we are aware that they, that may have been an issue in our survey research. Uh, when we start looking at Michigan digital literacy barriers compared to some other states, um, our digital literacy barrier is fairly potent, 17%. Um, um, again, state some sort of digital literacy as their primary barrier to home broadband adoption. Other barriers um, that, have, that, of course, I don't have data for on here, um, but that we came across were cost, uh, to broad, cost of broadband. Um, I don't find it relevant um, or I don't need it. I'm getting by without it. I access the Internet elsewhere. Um, and, of course, uh, they don't have access to broadband at home. Infrastructure isn't available. But looking at just digital literacy, we find that um, Michigan's instances of digital literacy as a primary barrier to adoption is fairly high, um, tied with Iowa, uh, but much higher than some of our other neighboring states, including Minnesota and Ohio, um, and, and two, two points higher than the average of all of these states together. If we break down that 17%, 12% of Michigan residents cite internet-related digital literacy, while only 5% state computer-related digital literacy. So that 5% would have been those that answered that I don't, I'm not comfortable using a computer, and the other 12% cited barriers to um, um, fraud and identity, and identity theft, not knowing what broadband is, or just not comfortable with it. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these categories um, today, but it will be um, available in the video and, and posted online in the PDF. Um, but I just wanted to, to cut some demogra demographic groups for your information and point out a few that, that really stand out. Uh, so we did uh, breakdowns by demographic group, by age, income, employment, education, gender, ethnicity, and children in the home. Um, and, and some of these are bolded where these groups are, we consider, vulnerable populations when it comes to digital literacy. Um, in the age category, 19% of, of those 65 and older said that digital literacy is their primary barrier. 24% of households that, that earn between $25,000 and $49,000 annually said that digital literacy is their primary barrier. 18% of the unemployed said that digital literacy is an issue. 
and 22% of minority populations said that digital literacy is, a, is their primary barrier to adoption. So we consider those four groups vulnerable populations in that their instance of digital literacy as a barrier was much higher than the rest of their group. So keep those four groups in mind. Um, some other things that we found, um, Michiganders who use the internet at work have household incomes that are three times higher than those citing digital literacy barriers to adoption. Again, those are self-reported um, household incomes from our survey, uh, but it's an important relationship to note. Um, we've seen that internet-related or software digital literacy is more of an issue than computer-related or hardware literacy in the state. And also these four groups um, we consider vulnerable populations seniors, the unemployed, households with incomes between 24 and 49,000, and then minority populations, they have the highest instance of digital literacy barriers as a barrier um, compared to the rest of their groups. So let's talk about what programs are out there to address digital literacy in Michigan. Um, we, we went through and we identified a number of different programs across the state um, both at a statewide level and that are implemented regionally um, to see what's, what's out there for communities, what's out there for residents, uh, for economic development prof professionals, for, um, uh, for workforce development professionals. And, we, and I wanted to summarize a few of them here. Um, the first one that, that came to mind is, is called Everyone On in Michigan. And it's actually the, the state's instance of a national digital literacy campaign that includes libraries and related organizations, the Ad Council, and a program called Connect to Compete, which is the FCC's uh, program to expand digital literacy. So all those groups got together to, to launch a campaign called Everyone On. Um, and this provides information for those seeking online and offline digital literacy training in their local area. Um, part of that program is the Michigan Electronic Library's um, platform called Learning Express. And this is available to any citizen of the state of Michigan uh, through mel.org. And it, it includes online, among many other things, it includes online self-paced training on a variety of digital literacy topics, including hardware, email, internet browser, and much, much more. Um, so this is a platform that's been out there for a long time. Um, and Everyone On is, a, is an, again, is a national campaign that's promoting resources like Learning Express. Um, another statewide program that was launched in 2009 is called Broadband Adoption Through Education and Entrepreneurship. Um, and that's, that was by Michigan State University. And it was a training program to assist um, industrial workers to find jobs in information and communications technology. Um, so retraining uh, unemployed industrial workers to uh, participate in the knowledge economy and ICT jobs. Um, and I believe that ended in 2012. Um, another program was called No Worker Left Behind. And while this wasn't information technology specific. It, it was a program that reimbursed college tuition for unemployed adults that were seeking education in high demand emerging sectors, which did include ICT, among other things like biotechnology. Um, so that, that was a program, and again, it was tuition reimbursement, so it wasn't directly focused on basic digital literacy skills, whereas the Learning Express um, curriculum is, is focused on basic digital literacy skills, and so is everyone on. Um, the campaign. Some other regional programs, um, one called Connector Community, was focused on inc increasing adoption among low-income households in the Detroit area. And then another called Sparking Broadband Use was a program at the Eastern Upper Peninsula School District that focused on connectivity, career building, government services, and education all in one. And it was a program that they implemented in the schools. Um, that it did have a one-to-one -one device program where I do believe they gave laptops to students to help not only uh, further their education online, but also to encourage home use of broadband by adults who may need it for job searching or to access government services, um, et cetera. Uh, this is just a quick screen cap of the everyoneon.org campaign website. Um, one of their big stats is that 62 million Americans don't use the internet, which is uh, fairly on par with our stats that we find in the state of Michigan. Um, and as you can see, there's a number of resources on here about you know, what is the internet, building awareness for what it is, what's it good for, is it safe, uh, helping to find a job. Um, and then this handy little zip code locator, you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what digital literacy training programs are available in your area or discounted broadband services available in your area um, from some of the Connect to Compete partners from the FCC. So just a, again, just a quick screen cap. Um, I encourage everyone to check it out and see if there's resources on here that your community might be able to use. 
Um, back in 2009, the federal government um, invested, I believe, $2.5 billion in the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program. And um, it was originally a $7 billion investment. A good portion of that went to broadband infrastructure, while the remaining $2.5 billion went to uh, digital literacy and, sus and sustainable adoption programs. And this is kind of a list of some programs from abroad that this, this project funded. Uh, digitalliteracy.gov actually has a best practices portal where anyone can go on and check out the res these um, kind of best practices and lessons from all of the programs that it funded over the last five years, four years. Um, some of those programs include a program called Keyspot, uh, which included computer centers and training in Philadelphia. Mouse, uh, was a, uh, we looked at training high school students to become digital media and technology experts to then go out and serve the community in digital literacy training. Every Community Online was a program in Ohio that created a network of trainers and centers throughout the state to provide digital literacy training um, at community colleges and libraries. Train the Trainer was a program that taught foreign language speakers to teach digital literacy skills in their native languages in various communities. And Project Endeavor um, looked at digital literacy for the deaf and hard of hearing. So this is just a small, small snapshot of the different programs that the BTOP project funded. Um, and again, digitalliteracy.gov has links to summaries of all these programs, lessons learned, how you can do it in your community. So I really encourage everyone to check that out too, um, to see what's been done, not only in Michigan, but uh, across the country as well. So in summary, um, there were a number of federally funded programs, uh, two and a half, I was right, two and a half billion dollars, um, between 2009 and 2012 that offer these great examples and best practices and resources for improving digital literacy. We have in Michigan several passive resources, including the Learning Express um, from Mel.org and the Everyone On campaign, which is an advertisement campaign, um, and some active programs for digital literacy training, again, in, in the Detroit area and the Eastern Upper Peninsula. Um, these programs could definitely be better leveraged locally to improve quality of life and workforce eligibility for those with any digital literacy barriers. Okay, so how do we take all of the information that we've gone through and the research that we did and really create a strategy for expanding and building digital literacy locally? Um, what, we, what we're proposing um, is, is a model to take some of these best practices and resources that we already have and, um, and create a digital, uh, digital literacy training task force in communities across the state. So these are some of these, just like we started with assumptions, these are some of the assumptions that we're looking at to, to um, drive this program. Again, more than 95% of occupations require the use of, of a computer, and more than 50% require the use of email or internet browser. Um, we have a lot of folks, 17% of non-adopting households state some form of digital literacy as their barrier to um, actually using broadband or the internet at home. Um, and 12% of those are internet related concerns and 5% hardware concerns. Um, and roughly 2 million Michigan workers use the internet at their jobs and again have incomes that are three times higher than those who state digital literacy as a primary barrier. So how can we improve upon the digital literacy of our communities in the state of Michigan. And I didn't point this out earlier, but I find it ironic that you need to go online to everyoneon.org to figure out how to get help to get online. Um, so that's why I put the phrase, take it offline on here. Um, and this program looks to do that. This model looks to do that, is to take the resources and um, that have been already been established, the best practices that we're gathering from across the country at digitalliteracy.gov, and figure out a way to do this um, in an offline, mostly offline and online environment, uh, because you can't point someone to a website to get digital literacy training help if they don't know how to get online. So the, the, the model that we're looking at follows six basic steps, and it actually follows a very basic planning model. Uh, first, we find someone to organize the task force and gather folks to be on it. Then we assess the need for digital literacy training locally. We then inventory programs and resources um, and research curriculum and best practices for digital literacy. We identify gaps and develop programs and partnerships to, um, um, to fill the need between the needs assessment and the inventory. We build awareness because letting folks know that these programs exist um, is definitely key. And um, then we want to develop support networks and reassess the need. 
and I'll, I'll go through each one of these. So the first step is to select an organizing entity and gather local community stakeholders and resources for this task force. Um, I haven't come up with a fancier name other than Digital Literacy Training Task Force. Uh, if somebody has a better idea, um, let me know. I'm open to suggestions. But the idea is to find organizations in your community that are organized around helping workforce or that work in the workforce and economic development sphere. Um, I, I state that collaboration, cooperation, and diversity are key. And I think you can see the diversity in some of these um, organizations that I listed here on the slide, that we want the task force to be made up of various entities that, again, revolve around the workforce and economic development sphere, but may have been excluded from conversations um, in the past when it comes to workforce development. So we want that diversity there to get people together that haven't that don't normally talk about that, that don't normally talk together about how to expand digital literacy. So that would include chambers of commerce, regional Michigan Economic Development Corporation staff, uh, local and regional economic development organizations, Michigan Works offices, libraries definitely, K-12 schools, and, and also higher education. Um, any remnants of Michigan Skills Alliances that you have in your communities. Um, local unemployment offices, local nonprofits that are working on digital literacy um, or workforce development, and then vocational education centers. And there's probably more here too, but these are just a couple examples of the types of stakeholders that we're, tr that, that we're proposing to get together to talk about this issue. Um, we don't define a community here either. Um, Michigan has lots and lots of different regions that um, that work in various ways. So we, we want these task, for, task forces to organize themselves around a geographic area that works best for serving that population. If it's a school district, if it, maybe the K-12 school wants to take, kind of take charge of this, progress, this, this project, uh, maybe it's the school district boundaries you use, maybe it's a county boundary, maybe it's a, an economic development region, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, it, it's fluid enough to organize this task force around a geographic area that works best for everyone involved. The next step is to assess the need, and there's really two components to this. The first is to analyze the digital literacy skills and gaps in the workforce. So just like um, our statewide research looks at um, figuring out who has a digital literacy issue, now we need to take it a little bit further and figure out what those um, what those skills look like or what that gap in skills looks like for the general population. Um, that's a big job. Um, and we, while we don't have model surveys designed or anything like that, um, there are a number of ways that can be done. Um, the second component for assessing the need is to look at the skills and demand and deficiencies in digital skills of current employees as perceived by local employers. So we want to look at both the supply and the demand for digital literacy skills. So the supply would be the workforce and the general pub public. And the demand is what are employers looking for? What kind of deficiencies have they noticed? Um, do they need anyone with any particular skills? So data gathering for this uh, should be convenient for the general workforce and employers to hopefully raise participation rates in the assessment. Um, but I, I realize this is a big task. Um, however, if you gather the right stakeholders together to form your task force, many of those members are in contact with both um, the general population, the general public and employers da almost daily. Uh, chambers of Commerce have contact with employers, economic development entities do, libraries have contact with the general public as do local governments. Um, so there's lots of different ways that this information can be gathered and if the surveys are simple enough, um, they could be uh, worked into you know, five or ten minutes at the end of a normal conversation that, that any of these task force members would have with, uh, you know, the general public or um, an employer. So there's, you have to get creative on how these surveys are implemented and the data gathered, but I think assessing the local need is definitely a good first step as it tells you what kind of defic deficiencies are we looking at. Um, they might be software-related, they might be hardware-related, as we've seen. So next um, is to inventory programs, resources, and research curriculum and best practices. And this can be done following the needs assessment or concurrently. Um, but the task force should really work to compile um, resource informa information locally. Um, and those resources could be found outside the task force itself. So for example, if you've gathered all those stakeholders together that I mentioned on the first slide, um, 
you know, one of them might find out that maybe the local Commission on Aging has a public computer center that they use to teach seniors how to use eBay um, or email or Facebook or whatever it happens to be. Um, they would want to be included in that, in that resource um, compilation. And the task force should also research those best practices and lessons from those federally funded programs that I was talking about. Um, so not only, you know, know what you have locally, but research what you might want to have or what, what might work for you um, based on some of these federally funded programs that have been going on in the last four years. Um, and again, those are at digitalliteracy.gov. Um, the task force should then work to create a digital and hard copy repository of resources that can be used as reference. So just as, as we brought up that um, it's kind of ironic that you, you're, you point someone to a website that doesn't know to look for digital literacy that's not digitally literate. Um, it's important to have this information out in the community so that folks know where they can go. Um, maybe there's a training class at the local library that you can, that the task force can help advertise. Um, maybe it is, maybe there are some self-paced online tutorials that folks, um, you know, if they could just open up, a, if they have a library and help them open up an internet browser, they can get to. Um, so think about how that information is portrayed to the public, um, or maybe it's, it's pushed out through the employers that you have contact with that are looking for folks with specific digital literacy skills. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways this information can be put out, but it has to be online and offline um, since this is, this is a, an offline to online issue. Uh, the fourth step um, is really identifying gaps between the needs assessment and the inventory that you created and develop programs and partnerships to fill those gaps. And this is where creativity is key. Um, one of the programs I mentioned that was federally funded by BTOP was looking to train high school students as digital literacy teachers in the community. Maybe that's a project that you can implement in your own, in, in your own town. Um, a lot of uh, schools require seniors to have a, a um, uh, community service, um, so many community service hours before they graduate. Uh, so maybe there's an opportunity to leverage that, that requirement to, and, and use some of our um, our young digital talent to, to teach digital literacy classes in the community. Um, these public-private partnerships are definitely looking to leverage existing resources uh, because there's not a whole lot of um, additional funding out there for these types of work. I do know that the BTOP project is not continuing at a federal level. Um, so it does need to leverage existing resources, but by having such a diverse task force, um, you're going to be creating a dynamic that hasn't existed before. So maybe there's a way for schools to talk to the chamber, to talk to uh, Michigan Works about some sort of project. And again, I don't know what all those answers would be, uh, but just having those folks in the room and talking about this topic and doing a needs assessment and creating that inventory, those answers will develop um, and those partnerships will be created. Um, we should always remember the vulnerable populations that we've noted at a statewide level need some extra help in developing digital literacy skills. Um, and maybe there's a chance to create programs that address multiple barriers to technology use. The Eastern Upper Peninsula um, program is actually a really good example of that, where one, they solved the device problem um, by giving students laptops at the school, um, but they also worked on getting discounted broadband service at home, which addresses the, the cost issue. And then, of course, they included digital literacy training in that. So they really hit three different barriers with one program. Um, and of course, that costs that costs some money. But maybe your community is already doing a one-to-one -one device program with students, and there's a way to leverage those devices that are already in the classroom to promote digital literacy not only with the students but with parents at home. So just a couple thoughts. Um, I like to say that this slide is where the where the magic happens. Um, and again, I don't have all the answers for what goes in this blue, big blue bubble, um, but we've definitely seen this this process work in the past. And once these diverse group of people get together and start talking about it. Um, that's when the answers start to present themselves. The fifth step um, is building awareness. So again, here there's two purposes, to inform the public and employers of the digital li literacy programs that they have available to them in the community, um, basic advertising and marketing, but to also establish and install the importance of being digitally literate. Uh, we found that some folks just don't feel they need to be, they just don't want to be. Um, but there's definitely, and I don't think we're going to get to ubiquity, but there's definitely ways that anyone can improve their quality of life via technology. Um, so I think building awareness for what 
technology can do for you, whether it's lifelong education, access to healthcare information, government services, whatever it happens to be. I think building awareness for that type of work uh, is also important. So not only the programs that you're putting together and, and, and advertising, but also building awareness for the importance of being digitally literate. And actually, the Everyone On campaign can help with that. There's a lot of material that's already created there, um, and I think taking that offline and, and advertising it locally uh, would go a long way in, in leveraging that resource that already exists. Uh, maybe there's a way to, to do videos or testimonials or interviews, booths at community events, flyers, newsletter articles. These are all just different examples of ways that you can get the word out there about both of these purposes for building awareness. And again, the building on the Everyone On campaign from the Library of Michigan um, might be a good place to start um, if, you're, if you're at a loss for ideas. And finally, uh, building follow-up and support networks is important. Digital literacy is, is, a lifelong, um, is a lifelong learning process. It's not something you just do once. Uh, we all know that software and hardware change. New technologies come out constantly. Um, we, always, we all always ignore the Windows needs to restart to update button in the corner of our screen. Um, so we all know that technology is constantly changing. Um, so there needs to be some sort of support in the community for those that, um, that need it. Um, you know, maybe there's a way to create ongoing um, gatherings of trainees um, that provides a safety net for new users that can drop in and out. Um, you can use exit surveys to figure out you know, who might be the most vulnerable for you know, not being a sustainable adopter of technology or maintaining those skills. Um, you can do scheduled follow-ups with vulnerable populations, again, by using the, the members of the task force that already have that kind of outreach, and especially with employers, um, so they can maintain forward momentum on a digitally literate community um, and making sure that, they, that their employees have the skills that they need to, uh, to do their job effectively. Um, so just some, some different ideas. Uh, we've, we've actually come across a, a community that um, um, is doing a program called Tea and Tech, where they get a lot of senior citizens together once a week or once a month to just talk about um, new devices. Maybe it's uh, maybe somebody brings an iPad and they pass it around and look at it and just and just learn more about it. Um, so there so there's lots of different examples of of ways that support networks can be built in through the task force and through the community uh, to really support the, our new adopting uh, digitally literate folks. So in conclusion, um, we see that. A digitally literate workforce is increasingly critical for community and economic development um, as those skills in the, in the workforce are becoming uh, in demand and, and commonplace. Um, and while digital literacy is not the primary barrier to broadband adoption in Michigan, it does represent a large number of adults without the ability to participate in the digital economy. Um, and finally, task forces of stakeholders charged with community workforce and economic development could provide a working model for improving digital literacy locally, um, you know, looking at that, that six-step model that, we, that, that I presented. Um, so that's, um, that's our co-learning plan, again, on you know, looking at, the, at why digital literacy is important, what might be a local model for uh, improving digital literacy with the resources that are out there. Um, again, digitalliteracy.gov, mel.org, um, everyoneon.org, Dot org are great, um, great places to go to, to start looking at uh, resources that might be able to benefit the community locally. Um, I do want to say that uh, my email and phone number are on here, so if you do have questions um, afterwards that you think about, please let me know. Um, and also on October 24th, we are hosting the 2013 Michigan Broadband Conference where we will be talking about digital entrepreneurship, digital job creation, um, technology use among small businesses, and all these other different topics. Um, that do relate to digital literacy. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's more information on our website, connectmi.org. And I will be at the summit next week um, at, uh, at the Kellogg Center um, in Lansing uh, to do a, a very similar presentation to those that attend there if you do have questions. Also, if you have questions now, we do have the, we have the chat box open if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, Jen asked about um, a program called Digital Promise. There's federal funding coming out of D.C. to go to schools for, um, I believe, digital training, digital devices, things like that. Um, there is also the, I should have mentioned this, um, the president announced the Connect Ed program um, a few months ago, um, and that is a program that's focusing uh, emphasis on providing uh, focus on, on digital literacy and technology in schools as well. 
And we, we do see Bob's comment that um, Ignite in Oscoda County continues to work with Tom Stevenson, who is um, one of my staff uh, working with communities across the state on broadband technology issues. Um, and we have, we have found that you know, digital literacy is an issue in some, of the, some communities uh, through that process. But um, um, I, I'm glad that, that you were able to join today. Any other questions, comments, before I turn it back to Jen? Oh, Ryan, um, yeah, um, the, the, digital works the Digital Works Program is actually going to be presented at our um, conference on October 24th um, in, um, at the Kellogg Center in, in, in Lansing. So if you go to our website, connectmi.org, one of the big panels on our front page talks about our conference. Um, and one of the sessions will be on digital job creation, which is the Digital Works Program uh, that we are working to bring to Michigan. Um, and I can get you some more information offline about that if you'd like. So 29% of Michigan residents do not subscribe to broadband at home, um, which is about 2.1 million adults. So 17% of that 2.1 million is this 361,000. And those are the ones that have the digital literacy barrier um, as their number one barrier to adopting broadband at home, if that helps. All right. So if we don't have any more questions, then I'd like to thank Eric for such a great presentation, as usual. This is the second time that we have supported his research with his team. And um, I know that we're very pleased. And I think that a lot of the content in the co-learning plan um, will be even more helpful. And the co-learning plan should be available on our website in a matter of weeks. We are making it ADA compliant right now, um, or at least making sure that everything has been um, made accessible. So all the graphs and charts, and as you can see, he has lots of them. So we have to make sure that those with um, impairments can, can read it on our website. So that's all we're doing. And then um, it'll also be available in hard copy version. I'm hoping we'll be printing that sometime in mid to late September. Um, so if you'd like to pick up a copy, you can contact me here at REI University Center. Um, we have a general REI email um, that all other questions and comments can be directed to, and that's rei at msu.edu. Um, so I think I, I also want to make mention, oh, there is another question? OK. Hi, Warren. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, it, it, Warren's question is, any thoughts on how to resolve locally competing leadership issues and the ability to lead solutions? Um, that is an issue. Uh, we've, um, we've discovered that in places across the state, um, it, not only in, in, in this position, but in my previous life as a planner as well. Um, I don't have a great solution for you other than, that, other than trying to knock down some of those um, those personality issues by bringing everyone together around an issue that people may not be that familiar with. Um, we have found that for some reason technology is an issue across across sectors and that's you know that's the business community, healthcare, education, local government, schools, I mean all, all these different groups that we're getting together not for digital literacy specifically but for broadband and technology planning across the state. It seems that simply getting them together to talk about an issue that they're all semi unfamiliar with seems to help. So we provide, provide some education on what this technology is, what it can do, um, and, and how it impacts all those industries. And we see that they're starting to work together, um, even in places that have traditionally had problems with, um, you know, with uh, local leadership butting heads and things like that, as, as we're all familiar with. Um, so I know that's not a great answer, but I believe the same scenario can apply to digital literacy, because it is an area that, other than libraries and uh, workforce development agencies, really um, people might be unfamiliar with. So there might be an opportunity to capitalize on that, that unfamiliarity and, and bring these folks together around a topic and provide some education, uh, maybe from an outside source, um, that, helps, that helps calm down some of those, those leadership issues that you mentioned. Again, I, that's not a great answer, but um, I think that's what we've been seeing in a number of communities across the state when just talking about technology generally. OK, one more um, something else I want to mention is that we are actually doing another digital literacy related webinar tomorrow.
Um, so if you've been paying attention to the REI announcements or updates, um, tomorrow is online post-secondary education for workforce development, Net Smart States and Students, and this is with Stephen Weiland. Um, he is a um, faculty member of faculty here at MSU, and we thought it was uh, this is a great pairing having um, Eric and Steve in the same week, um, and Steve will see it from a, a, a different perspective. He does teach in the higher ed learning. Um, an education group, the Hale group here on campus. So he teaches online classes, um, a lot of uh, the older students, and, and he'll have a different perspective. So it's open educational resources that I guess is his um, big promotion. That's what he's trying to um, address in his research. So his co-learning plan will also be on the website, I'm hoping, in another week or so. And both of them will be presenting at the Innovate Michigan Summit on September 4th at the Kellogg Center. And if you haven't registered, um, registration closed. However, we may start a waiting list. So if you are interested, please phone here at 517-353-9555. Uh, That's 517-353-9555. And we will put you on our waiting list. and, um, and we We'll squeeze you in if you would like to be there. We'll have several presenters um, on lots of different, very innovative topics for economic development. Um, thank you again, Eric. And um, if you um, caught this in the middle, we did record this webinar, and it will be transcribed, and it will also be on the website um, hopefully soon. And uh, if not, we'll, we'll send out an announcement, and you'll be alerted to when it is on the website. So thank you again, everybody, and um, I look forward to maybe a few of you tapping in tomorrow for Steve's webinar. Bye-bye. Have a good day.